Hi, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Advisory Advantage podcast, where we do deep dives in interviewing accountants and business advisors who are really cracking the code and knowing how to market, sell, and deliver advisory to their business clients. I'm MC Carter, founder of Practice Paradox. We're digital marketing strategists for accounting and advisory firms globally. And today, again, I'm aided and abetted by my very good friend across the ditch. Thank you, MC. Um, For those of you who don't know me, Richard Francis, CEO of Spotlight Reporting uh, and Chartered Accountant of 20 years experience as well so thrilled to be joining you and see i was just over your side of the ditch actually and well and certainly not quite your neck of the woods and enjoyed that really good weather um but anyway we better get on to introducing our wonderful guest in episode four prue mcstay of astute mode down in the dare i say it, slightly less sunny christchurch that yeah, hotbed right. of accounting intrigue uh welcome prue you're a cpa i see so yeah, slightly different true membership body there um welcome thrilled to have you here and i think mc wants me to just get straight in with a question uh so astute mode what an interesting name for an accounting practice (laughs) yes it is yeah thanks for having me mc and richard nice to see you both again um yeah, it is an interesting name and I wanted right from the start, we're nine years old now, I wanted right from the start to be able to convey to people in our name that we weren't, we're not just box ticking accountants. I wanted people to feel like when they worked with us that they switched into the astute mode, that they switched into the astute way of working. So mm-hmm. that's the reason for the name. And I think I said to MC recently, way was taken on the domain so that's why it's mode uh-huh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's normally a good pragmatic reason for these things yeah yeah so you've you've quietly um beavered away down there for a number of years now and and really made a quite a name for yourself um can you maybe just outline for our listeners where it all started i mean you had a bit of a company background uh, so slightly different to sometimes the whole kind of university and then become accountant and practice yeah, so my background is um, I got dragged to Christchurch by my husband. Um, so <laughs> I never planned on living in Christchurch or New Zealand. Um, and and my background in Australia was in uh, the corporate world. Um, and so coming to Christchurch, there isn't a lot of corporate accounting um, work. So kind of a natural... I guess a gap that I could see missing in the market was was that for small businesses, they needed what the corporate finance departments had, but there wasn't a lot of people at that time offering that service to clients at a price point that they could really afford. So that's where we started out, providing um, the doing and then also the CFO type views of the business and advice for the clients. Um, and in, in, in most cases, they still stuck with their existing accountants to do the compliance. Um, over time, that's changed as our services change, but that's where it started from. So uh, starting um, in, in a new town, obviously there was all sorts of things going on in, in Christchurch in, in, in those years. Um, with, with the background you had, the Australian twang, uh, it must have been quite, you know, it's conser- it conservative down there. I don't want to offend anyone. I've got it. My, my mother's from Christchurch, so uh, I have some experience down there. It is conservative. How did you find kind of flying in, putting out your shingle and saying, here I am, I'm going to do really cool services with you? Yeah, it's actually interesting, that question, because the person that first employed me and then helped me with connections along the way, she was someone that was trying to set up business in Australia. So my Australian experience really appealed to her from that perspective. Um, And then one of the very first people that she referred me to was an Australian here in business, which wasn't by design. It was just that there was a woman in town that had multiple um, retail service site that um, had really poor administration and and financial, uh, not financial advice, but fo- ad- advice around finances and she needed help and so I was referred on to this person. So I don't know, it's just growing from there and 
now a lot of people don't really realise I am Australian until I say some numbers. Or Your accent's like sounding a little bit more cultured now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> so can I ask, Prue, you know, why advisory for you? What's lighting your fire? Why didn't you want to be just the, um, I think your term earlier was the box ticking accountant. Why do you care about delivering advisory to, to your clients? Um, I think the thing is, for me, that was my background in corporate anyway. That's what we did for the business units inside the business. And that prior education was really, um, I, I guess, just just showed, showed that that kind of accounting is far more interesting than the, the rear-facing accounting. Um, so it's more exciting to be walking beside someone, holding their hand, stepping them through uh, whatever the next steps are that are happening in their business as opposed to going, oh, and, yeah, I'm sitting here talking about your last year's results and you owe this much in tax. It just doesn't help anyone really. The compliance, as we all know, doesn't get the bank loan for the expansion next ne next year that you're planning. So that's kind of why. And what with your journey, Prue, in delivering more advisory than the typical firm does to their clients, what have been some of the challenges that you've overcome along the way or that you may still be addressing? I think one of the biggest challenges is myself that um, you've helped with over the last kind of 18 months, MC, I guess, um, is and in kind of in preparation for our chat today it's like what do what is our our advisory success stories and it's like oh you know we don't really have any advisory success stories and then I'm like actually everything we do is an advisory success story we just don't <laughs> recognize it or I just don't recognize it so that would be the biggest challenge and the biggest challenge is com for me is conveying to people what we do that's different from what the other accountant down the road does and what the other accountant down the road sees that they can do. So that's the mm -hmm. biggest challenge. Um, the second one would be finding team um, members that are on board with that vision and the way that the, how they work needs to change to make sure that we're delivering that kind of service to the client. So how do you define what you do differently to the accountant up the road? Because um, this is a million dollar question in a way. Um, you know, there's been so much noise on all the social channels around advisory versus compliance. I mean, I think it's, there's a lot of bleed between the two anyway, but how, what kind of competitive advantage from your skill set do I get if I come to astute mode rather than vanilla accounting limited? Well, at the end of the day, I don't know that, it, it is different from vanilla accounting different uh, vanilla accounting limited except for our personality and um, the enthusiasm we bring to it um, the skill sets the same except that we can ha have a conversation with you about what's important to you in your life mm. we, we don't need to fall back on our technical skills that we do have, and so does Vanilla Accounting Limited of, oh, yeah, we can read the ledger and we can work out how your business works and all of that kind of stuff. But mm. it's it's what's important to you, Richard, like who's in your family, what are your kids doing, what are your parents doing, is it, yep. is, you know, what's your priorities, is it your boat, is it your holiday, is it your house, what is it? And so it's having those conversations with our clients more frequently than anything else so, so i think you just undersold yourself because i i heard two things there one was a, you're actually going to ask me some questions about my life holistically mm. and you're going to talk to me about goals now they seem really obvious things don't they and of course we we bang on about this stuff that spotlight and the transform book i wrote and all of that but accountants don't do that so you must have had a number of clients come to you and i am intrigued by the fact you didn't really push the accounting side too much early on um, because of that skill set, but also there must be, so I'm going to push you a bit here, there must be some service offerings that do show your colours as being slightly different to vanilla accounting. Um, I guess it's just how we package it. We do everything for you. 
Mm -hmm. um, from an accounting perspective. So we do the planning with you and we do the doing for you and we bring it all together and we review where you've got to. And then you know, I have someone at the moment who's, when they set their budgets for this year, they set what I thought was pretty soft budgets, but they um, set them. And now I have had a conversation with them today going, come on, you've smashed those budgets by 50%. You've mm. got to revise them for the remainder of the year because what's pushing you if you're continually yeah. smashing those budgets? So, um, I don't know. That's just it. That's everything. You, you, you said three things there, Prue, I'm going to pick on uh, in a nice way because um, I just wish everyone had these as considered as standard vanilla accounting mm. budgets. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be on next to Richard Branson now if everyone did budgets yeah. um, planning. And I see that you had a bit of a planning background in your CV as well. So just, just doing that business planning mm. and then reviews, having those check-ins. Um, I know MC wants to expand on some of this stuff, but there's three things that we kind of think vanilla accounting does, but they often don't. And I think that's where, uh, for us, the, the, the budgets and the planning, that's kind of, normal that's like I just said it's just an accepted way that we work but the yeah. the reviews this wasn't even a formal review this was a chat on the phone hey mm. just keeping in contact with the clients on a regular basis um, of course we have the catch-up meetings on a monthly basis but this is just an interim yeah. chat um, <laughs> Well, I'm glad Richard picked up on you underselling yourself because <laughs> uh, on, on the upside, you've normalized what is really not normal in the typical accounting firms. I think you may be comparing yourself to the progressive accounting firms that you mix mm. with and that you know that, oh, yeah, budgeting's normal, planning's normal, your clients actually hearing from you uh, is normal, et cetera. Monthly catch ups, regular calls, um, you know, it's all actually the DNA of a very progressive firm. Of course, that's one of the reasons you're here so that others can can hear your story. but did right. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of ticking the boxes of what advisory actually is here in my notes. And I think kind of the beauty of it is that you don't necessarily see it as anything special. You see it as just what we should do. And I think that has a little bit to do with the fact that I'm from a corporate background. Mm. In a corporate background, whilst sometimes isn't the best education, also does show you that not one finance person can for every single finance need that your business has so it's really important that you don't just have the admin person in the office trying to do everything because they can't um so i but but i think that that corporate background has given me that um understanding that everybody needs mm. the different areas of business you all need a budget you all need a plan somebody actually needs to be a specialist at doing whoever it is so that the person that is planning and budgeting and reviewing isn't getting lost with the view of the woods for the trees of oh yeah. gosh i think that transaction's in the wrong spot i can't see the big picture that's that's why i think i think it's normal <laughs> yeah so you know you've come in at being a future focused accountant from day one with your management accounting background and to you the backward facing you know historical accounting whilst we all know it's important to you that's just detail that needs to be done well let's have a conversation about how you're going to hit or expand your budget. So you're really kind of like performance management for your clients, really. Yeah. We, we need a hashtag MC, um, hashtag normalizing advisory, don't we? Because everything Prue has said has been very, very sensible. And what, for example, when I came into the accounting industry and I didn't have Prue's corporate background straight out of university, I, and I sat there and I kind of thought, that this is just stuff we should be doing. Why aren't we doing it a standard? And of course, there is the tyranny of time and, um, you know, too much compliance bogging you down. But I, 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 I do want to talk to you a little bit about your business model, Pro, because I think you've come in almost with a, a different perspective, a, a clean slate, and being able to create something where advisory or, or the kind of normal stuff you did in corporate is standard. Can you talk a little bit more? I think you touched on early that you didn't really try and hoover up too much accounting, old-fashioned accounting per se at the start but it just kind of happened over time. What did your business model look like? And also, do you have a rough idea of your skew between advisory and compliance revenue streams? So um, we started providing bookkeeping, management accounting, and CFO services. So uh, the restriction 
was that I wasn't public practice certified. And when I first moved to um, New Zealand, CPA only had a membership presence. But because they were here as a membership presence, the Institute had decided that they weren't going to invite any CPA members into the Institute anymore. So yeah. it was a little bit stuck. So I had to kind of wait until CPA got their public practice presence sorted. Um, when we did get that uh, certification happening, that's when we could offer um, you know, the normal ticking the boxes accounting service, but we didn't go out there chasing those people because primarily we were busy with the other sort of business that we did. Nice. Um, mm. so it's just happened over time as, as it becomes, so we might've had the bookkeeping and management accountant for somebody that had a group of 10 organizations mm. and, and they had another accountant. And then over time, all the, um, like the business advisory would come from us because we were close to the numbers. So it didn't make sense for them to send their books elsewhere for the accounting work to be done, you know, the yeah. end of year accounting work to be done. So that's kind of how that accounting has kind of grown organically. Really. You've done a reverse evolution. A lot of compliance focused firms are trying to evolve to advisory. You started as advisory and needed to add the compliance piece uh, later, which makes you, you've got fundamentally different DNA, so to speak, from, from many firms. Lots of people would say that about me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you're, and you're cross-cultural. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, with that whole continuum that we, we talk about of, you know, market, sell, deliver, need to do all three things. You mentioned earlier, you know, getting the message out there, how you differ from other firms. So that's an aspect of marketing, obviously. And you mentioned the second point, Prue, about getting the right team members. I'd mm -hmm. like to address both of those um, today, but let's go back to that one about message. What what have you been doing? What's working? What hasn't worked around that messaging piece about getting people to understand up front that you're different? Mm, I think that we... I don't know. <laughs> I think that what works mostly is when we sit with them and, and talk with them um, about what we do and how we do it. So it's it actually is quite a labour-intensive task in some ways to um, get, uh, you know, attract the new clients. Um, and I guess that's because even though I'm le I've been learning a lot from you, I haven't implemented a lot of that. Um, so that's this next stage that we're moving into is, um, okay, so we're about delivering astute advice to business owners. Um, this is how we do it. We have this methodology that we follow and this is why we do this and this is the benefit for you. So um, we're kind of just about ready to push that kind of stuff to the market. So you've done the foundation in sort of learning about value proposition and that you realised that you didn't have a clear value proposition, but you've now got one that you formulated, but you really haven't actually just rolled it out yet? No, we haven't done that work yet. That's, that's out there. And to give people context, the sorts of types of businesses because one of the things that paradox that we teach firms is don't try to attract the small business market because that's a challenge with digital marketing but to pick some focused target markets what are the ones that you've been attracting and that you'll continue to focus on moving forward yeah so unusually we well not really unusually but when i say this people kind of take it back we focus on retailers because um, that's kind of my background but also Retail extends to e-commerce and then there's also kind of the hybrid retailers that provide a service alongside like a interior designer that makes the, uh, in, the the window furnishings and things like that or the nursery that sells the plants and does the landscape design. So um, we do those sorts of clients. We do salons. Um, we, we also have a segment called business services. So that tends to focus around engineers, project managers, architects, that those kind of businesses. Um, yeah. Okay. And with the, you know, we talk about the, the, the flaws in the whole menu of services approach, which menu of services typically is just listing out a bunch of product or service names, et cetera, and instead sell the journey, you know, sell the process. Um, do you mind sharing what you've, formulated and about to roll out around explaining to someone rather than in 
accounting speak, but in speak that they can relate to what you're going to help them and where you're going to take them? Yeah, so we've just, we've been down that route before where we do have the menu of services and people want to cherry pick the services and we don't want to do that. And, and, and the reason that this methodology has been put together is one on advice from you, but also that it makes sense. So we want, we're calling the product the Astute Mode product. Um, and basically we're going to take you through a journey of connecting with you, helping you plan, doing the work for you, refining the output from that work. So reviewing and going back and reforecasting certain areas based on what we know. And then, and then really taking the time to look at all of that with them and helping them sit back and enjoy the output of that. So we've got that connect, do refine and do site that we're going to um, work people, uh, take people through. So that planning s uh, segment in that product r refers to the cash flow pa planning and the budgeting and the business planning that needs to happen. The doings obviously like we'll do for you what needs to be done. Um, we want to actually do everything for clients because we find that when we do everything, that end of year process is kind of non-existent. It just mm -hmm. happens because it's all being done right throughout the year. We want to then be able to take into account, you know, using the spotlight reports in the um, dashboards and the forecasts that, um, you know, this is where you're at. This is where you wanted to be. This is now what you're going to have to do to get there. And then they can sit back and enjoy it all. So, nice. Yeah. What we're I'm, trying. I, I, I'm going to ask a number here um, without giving, out, giving away too many state secrets. But what does a what, what does an ideal client look like for you? Is it you know you've got your business planning, your forecasting, your spotlight reporting, other things you mentioned? Are we are we kind of is this a ten grand, twenty grand proposition for you? North of that, if you're doing everything, what's what's your ideal client when you see someone walk in the door and you've asked them the right questions? So I think. Yeah, so I think what we're going with is there's two versions of this and it's kind of for the, the real variations come into the doing. Yeah. So um, the planning and the forecasting and everything like that is pretty much the same in each kind of level of package. So we've kind of said about 15 grand and about 20, 25 rather, not nice. 25, about 23. So... It's just, and, and those fluctuations are really around the doing. Mm. Because if someone's, you know, dealing with, I don't know, 200 suppliers a month, well, there's a little bit more work than there's yeah. someone dealing with 20. There's always those one-offs that, that pop up as well. But if, if you're targeting clients at that level and, and you know, some of, the, some of the stats we see around kind of average revenue per, per client being two or three grand a year, um, you know, that, that in itself is a really clear delineation between your kind of firm and, and what the the number crunches do. Yeah. Um, we, we always get this kind of, oh, you know, oh, Richie had great clients or you're in a big city or something. You know, you know, <laughs> Wellington's not really big. Christchurch isn't really big. Are they out there? Have you hoovered them all up in Christchurch or is it actually just a case of listening to these guys and finding out what they need? I think it's a case of getting out there and having conversations and making people know that that's what you do. Mm. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of our customers come through referral because, um, nice. that, I mean, that's probably no different to anybody else. But, yeah, there, there are people out there and when you can convince them that like, the, the, even the person in the admin, in the person who's in their office who is their an admin person, who runs their life and do, runs their life and does their bookkeeping? Well, wouldn't it be better if we took that doing off them as well and freed them up to help you more? Mm. So it's that kind of we've got to build that trust with the new clients yeah. and then give them more time back. And whether it's their time or their administration person's time, because yeah. no matter how good they are at that, we're going to be able to do it better. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. I think I think being able to do you know the core services ranging right across bookkeeping but accounting but not losing sight of the huge importance of, of business planning goal setting and all that is is still actually quite rare out there and it's it's wonderful to hear that you're doing that and monetizing it because um, one thing we do see at spotlight quite regularly are firms 
either doing it or trying to do it, but being really scared to monetize it. So I have no doubt that M MC is making sure you extract as much value as possible um, within the context of the market you operate in, of course. Mm. And it's interesting, I think, the mindset issue around if there are firms listening to us right now on this podcast and they think $20,000 client, you know, we're sitting at three or 4000 it's in their own head that that's expensive, right? The word expensive or phrases I hear like, oh, it's a big ask to get our clients on an advisory. It's like, well, by the sounds of things, you wouldn't buy your own advisory services if you think that's a lot of money because when we've taken firms from an average fee of three or $4,000 per client per year to 10, 15, 20, the clients that they bring on see it as a bargain because they're not comparing to the cost of their last accountant. They're comparing it to their internal cost if they were trying to get Sam or Sally, et cetera, internally to do it. So you can get it done better for far less than they probably could do in-house. Would, would you agree with that, Prue, around the, you know, the, the value contrast there? Yeah, and that's the one, that's the big thing that we have to convey because, you know, spending 16 grand with us includes your, or 15 or 16 grand with us, includes your end of year accounts, right? But it includes all those other things, your, your planning, your budgets, your forecasts, your quarterly reviews, that sort of stuff. And you don't have to deal with someone sitting in your office providing you bad information or or somebody who you needed to be there on Monday and then they've run, run in sick or, mm. or whatever it is. You don't need to deal with that anymore. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you're taking some stress points away, aren't you, and also giving yeah. direction, which I think are two of the main reasons why, you know, I'm so passionate about advisory as well. Um, it's really what it's about. It's what we're here to enable the kind of SMB sectors of our of our countries to be as good as they can be. Yeah. Um, I, I'm conscious we've, we've probably only got a, a couple more minutes, but um, there'll be a lot of firms listening to this, uh, a lot of people wanting to know, and, and probably being encouraged actually by how normal you made it all sound, because I think at times people uh, put the fear of advisory and changing your business model out there. What's what's one thing, Pro, that you'd say to accountants who may be uh, uh, earlier in the journey than you are or are trying to re-revive who they wanted to be, what's the one bit of advice you'd give them? Um, gosh, <laughs> there's so many pieces. <laughs> well, you can have more than one if you want. There's so many mistakes I've made. <laughs> um, I would say try not to be everything to everyone. Like, it doesn't work and you're not going to be able to solve everyone's problems and nor are you going to be able to improve everyone because some people don't want to learn. So be really discerning with who you take on as a client. Okay, so um, have a high bar on your client acceptance. That's yeah, it. yeah, very much so. And then systemize as much as you can. And we've been an early adopter of software right from the very start. I mean, I had no background in... Um, you know, accounting, really, the accounting we're talking about. Yeah. So zero was the only solution to me because, my, you know, anyway, that's how it's grown. So yeah. we've always adopted technology, but what we're really struggling with at the moment is all the little pieces. So we've got zero, we've got PI, we've got a lot of systems that need to talk to each other and we really need to concentrate on that integration piece. So that getting getting it all talking really well is really important as well so that you're not spending a lot of internal administration okay. because that should be focused on customer care. Nice. My last question for you, Prue, is if you could travel back in time, what would you do differently to get where you are now faster or with less effort if you had your time over again? Um. I think I would, uh, oh, I don't know, it's like so many, um, <laughs> probably just really get our content right for the marketing to the niches. So we probably would have, should have defined those niches earlier um, and because they came by osmosis anyway, but then just really got that content creation right so that we were positioning ourselves as the authority in that market so that naturally people were just coming to us. Um, 
you know, I did make the mistake of, oh, yeah, I'll take that whatever. Yep, I'll take you on because I think we can help you and it doesn't always work. Good advice. Answered the same question. Gave you the same answer for two different questions. <laughs> no, no, you came at it from a, two different angles. Yeah. Great. Well, um, Prue, thanks so much for taking time out of what is always a busy day in an accounting and advisory firm. Okay. Really appreciate you doing that. And I can't wait to see you rolling out your more focused value proposition, your holistic sort of description of the offering, because I think uh, next time we interview you, um, it will be some very exciting news about uh, the growth and how many people you are now serving in those niches. Yeah. That's the plan. So thank you uh, both for having me. It's been great to catch up. Pleasure. And thank you for letting us know that advisory is normal if you just have the right mindset. <laughs> and really choosy about which clients. We definitely got that message. Yeah, cool. All right. Nice to see you. Thanks, Prue. See you soon, Prue. Bye.